Maybe I should do that. Hard to maintain <laughs> at the moment. Righto. Um, so if um, if you're not muted already, can you please click your mute buttons? Um, and so just a bit of housekeeping. If you've got questions during the webinar, you can either put your hand up and ask John and Fergus directly, or you can type them in the chat box and we'll get to them um, throughout the presentation. If we don't get to all the questions during the webinar, we'll follow up um, and get back to you with answers. The meeting's been recorded and we'll have this uh, available on the Hobart Landcare website. So I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders, both past and present. Public Land Care has funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program to run this adaptive farming systems project, which aims to deliver a series of workshops which focus on the function of healthy soils, pastures and livestock under a range of different management systems. So the purpose of these workshops is to provide an opportunity for you guys, for the farmers, to reflect on your own management strategies for meeting production goals. And these workshops provide an insight in um, how other landholders are managing and adapting their decision making to deal with severe weather events, changing markets and environmental impacts, while maintaining the health of their soils, um, natural assets and livestock. So Holbrook Land is not endorsing any particular management system, but rather this project is highlighting strategies that are being used um, to put focus on preserving the long-term integrity of our soils, along with achieving sustainable production outcomes. So tonight we're gonna to have a look at how the Hassel uh, family has managed change across Jurgar, which is south of Holbrook. Jono and Fergus and Francine have been extremely accommodating and generous with their time. We actually had a surprise visit today from the Minister for Environment, Susan Lee. She dropped into the office and then we took Susan out to Jurgal um, to discuss the Smart Farms funding that's supporting this Adaptive Farming Systems project and these farmer webinars. So I think she really enjoyed it and um, we appreciate um, Jono and Francine being put on the spot a bit with regard to your sustainable management practices. So um, kicking off, we've made a short video of um, Jurgal which provides a brief overview of what Jono and Fergus are doing. And I'll just add the link to the chat box. We'll get everyone to watch the video on, the, on your own computer and then come back to the meeting once it's finished. It's about five minutes. So just hang on. And um, um, now if you go to the chat box, can you see it? I'll put the link up before everyone joined. Kylie, can you see that link? Okay, just hold on. Yeah, just redo it, Phoebe. It's not in the chat box yet. That's all right, I'll just redo it. Have you got everyone on? You're not yeah. doing it to somebody private? No, there you go. See if you can see, can you see it now? No. Not yet. <laughs> Now it's there, so can it. So, yeah, have a watch of the video. It's a bit over five minutes, and then you can come back to the meeting. Very good. Uh, you got another link there. The one I'm getting says video unavailable. Is that just me? No. Um, it's a good video, Jono. <laughs> so you're going to no, mine's coming up as um, unavailable too. Oh, that's good. That's reassuring. That's it's a great start, isn't technology. it? Technology. You can share your screen with it and watch it from your screen. We can. Is anyone else good? Yeah, we got Are it now. Yep. Oh, All shit. good now. Maybe. Share screen, you're in. All good now.
What's the matter? I'm supposed to be watching a video and it was on, I thought it was on chat. What have I got to do? I don't know. Mute yourself, Andrew. I can't work. Mute. Um, so is everyone finished? Yep. All 
All right, is every, yep, everyone back from the video? Yep, I think so, Kylie. You okay. go. You so look, I was gonna, just gonna kick off discussions. I think that um, if, if you put your mouse down to the bottom of the screen. Um, I think Kylie, you know. please put your camera on. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh, oh we're doing well tonight, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> the Zoom etiquette has just gone out the window. Nobody touch the share screen button, please. <laughs> I think, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a long haul on Zoom. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I guess if I can start to kick off the discussion, I really came for people to probably type um, questions in the chat directly, but if you have your video on, you can put up your hand. I just, we don't have the hand thing down here. So you might actually have to physically turn your video on and, and wave around if you um, would like to say something. Um, but what I, I thought I'd kick off the discussion. So again. Known capacity of the country. The management system here, I've seen change from somebody shared this video on from the map. Selling the end of the seasons. Somebody still. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> this ran so smoothly the last three times we did it. <laughs> um, I've had three of these webinars before, and I um, so that the as Phoebe pointed out, the purpose of the project is really and can you the, the farming systems type out of the equation and just look at you know the main goals um, to what for sustainable agriculture in this area. And we've got some really common themes coming out. So, you know, it's about soil health um, and having healthy, productive pastures. Um, it's about ground cover. So one of the critical factors that's come out a few times is about having a ground cover target and a plan on how, how to manage that. Um, and having a beautiful place to live, I think is a really important thing. Um, so that investment in revegetation and um, as well as the, you know, it brings a lot of public benefit in terms of biodiversity and environmental good, but you know, it's also important. You have to live on the farm. So it's important that, you know, it's a place that you enjoy and want to live in. Um, so I'm going to kick off the questions. So there are a couple coming through, but I'll, I just wanted to ask Jono, so, I mean, you've been around the region for a while. I mean, what do you think are the main sort of changes you've seen since you've been here? And I, I guess I'm talking about environmental changes, you know, just the way farming businesses are running. Um, thanks for the question, Kylie. Can, can I just start off by saying thank you and Phoebe very much for asking us to be part of this. Um, when you first asked us, I wasn't sure whether we actually fitted the criteria of adaptive farming systems. Um, but the more I think about it, the, the more I guess everyone adapts in their own way to different um, different outside influences, and I guess we know different to that. We've made a few, you know, fairly large decisions over the last 25 years in our business, and I guess that's uh, that's adapting. But, you know, we, we have adapted to different different influences. Um, also, just want to quickly thank everyone who's logged in to for giving up a bit of your evening to uh, on, the, on the off chance that we might say something interesting or informative. Um, so thank you all, m m very much appreciated. Um, I hope you get something out of it. Um, yeah, the changes, your question, Kylie, changes in the industry or the environment. Well, you mentioned just before that you've made some big changes over the last 20 years, what were they? Yeah, I probably should go back a little bit to give everyone who doesn't know so well a bit of background. So we moved to Holbrook about 24 years ago, um, born and bred in Braidwood on the Southern Tablelands, east of Canberra. Uh, my family, our family has been farming there for, well, since the early 1850s. And um, we decided back then to, we'd been committed to selling our wieners in the wiener sales up there, um, which are which are quite, quite well known sales in, in the, Southern Tablelands of Monero, um, but we felt we were very locked into having to sell them before winter and uh, being forced to sell when at times market buyers weren't ready in, in the, down in this part of the world. People weren't, didn't have it, hadn't had an order break, weren't ready to buy calves. So we were kind of 
locked into that system and we didn't feel we had enough control over our own um, marketing and value adding of our cattle. So, so the decision was made to buy country in Holbrook and that was the first, I guess, momentous decision for us. It was a big change and a bit of a, you know, a bit of a, a punt, I suppose, as to how it would all work out. And um, so that was in 1994, we, we bought the first block of country here. Then 1996 and 2001, we, we added to that. And that that made up the um, the, the property of Jurgo where we are now. So, um, and that gave us the opportunity to grow our own steers out beyond weaning and market them in our own way and value add. And, and, and also, we're looking for feedback as to how the cattle were going, which we hadn't had because people buy, buying, well, they would either buy our wieners or not, but we didn't really understand the reasoning behind that. But now that we have direct contact with, with a lot of markets, we get direct feedback about how, how they're going. So, and that led me to the other, you know, a fairly large decision that we had to make to adapt. And that was that, the cattle we were running before, which um, you know, basically inherited from my father, were actually not performing in the marketplace, and um, it took a while for that feedback to get back to us. But eventually, we we got that. Um, so we had to make a decision about what we do with that information. So we were running a, a hundred percent pole Hereford herd. We decided that at that point that trying to improve the cattle and improve our market reputation through staying with the Herefords was going to be quite hard and, and take a long time. So we decided to to bite the bullet and completely change change breeds. And um, we did that through crossbreeding with Angus cattle and which is what the market was demanding. And, um, and that's how we've got to where we are. And, and so that allowed us to Put a fresh face to the market with with different cattle, and um, as we improved our genetics, we were able to to win back buyer approval of our cattle to the point now where we're you know, they're in demand now, whereas the, it was you know getting quite hard to sell them before. So they're probably the two biggest adaptations we've made. Uh, the first one with the the move to Holbrook was as much a climate adaptation as well as a market one because we had um, you know all of our eggs in one basket in a cold winter tablelands climate um, the whole climate's different it's still cool in the winter but um, it's a very different rainfall pattern and, and really complements braidwood very well so um, yeah so that was the environmental adaptation and then the breed was more the marketing adaptation so yeah, that's that's how we've come to be where we are. And then two years ago, 2018, we we purchased Luana just down the road at Mullingandra, and that was really just an expansion thing, really, I guess, just to um, just to try and grow the business. Um, I've got a question here, Jono, from Lucinda, who asks, "Who do you think has influenced your decisions the most?" Um. Good question, Lucinda. Um, depends which decisions. Uh, part of decisions, Andrew Cumming was, we used Andrew for a lot of years in early days and he was fantastic. And I think he had a huge influence on the way we looked at pastures and production and soil health and all those, those sort of things. Um, the, the cattle, the genetic decision, um, that was really more just us seeing that things weren't going as well as they could be and we needed to change. And I guess just amongst ourselves, we decided which way to go in that direction. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I know, fantastic. Um, look, I just want to ask um, Jono about your carving. Um, so when are you carving and what decisions are you making regarding your progeny? So we discussed a bit today, but yeah, if you could just expand a bit on that. Um, so joining, joining late October, um, or heifers, heifers from early October, cows from late October. So carving, carving mid, mid to late July, early August. Um, really, 
we've always been a spring carving system, mainly because that's pretty much all you can do at Braidwood. Um, you can't, you know, it's, it's not economic to carry cows and calves through the winter up there in an autumn carving situation. So spring carving is really the only choice. And, um, and you know, through lots of benchmarking in the past, we've, we've felt that that was, that was okay to stick with, stick with a spring carving system in this part of the world as well, even though a lot of people down here do carve in the autumn. Um, so everything's, we run breeders at both ends, so everything's coordinated to happen at the same time of the year. Um, so, we, so we're actually carving, carving probably three, three weeks later than what we used to. Um, the main reason behind that actually was um, grass tetany. So grass tetany can be an issue. And, and to, I, I remember talking to Ian Locke quite a while ago about his, he moved his carving later and he said it completely solved all his grass tetany issues. So I thought, well, that's, that sounds worthwhile. So, um, so we pushed that back a bit. So we're carving later, we're weaning earlier. And that's giving the cows more time to um, to pick up in condition and, and recycle for the next joining and, and ready for the next calving. Um, so we're weaning in normally about April, sometimes late March, early April, um, and and then growing the steers out here until this time the following year. So that's pretty much the program feed. And um, and then that when you're taking them off like when you're selling um, your steers or progeny and taking them off your paddocks, is that, do you make that decision based on your ground cover estimates at the time or is that a predetermined um, time frame? You've locked them into a market and you just keep them for that amount of time? Well, it's, it's the decisions made, I suppose, that we'll be selling most of our calves in the, in the spring, mid to late spring, I suppose, and, and, feed on offer will determine when that happens in that time frame but in the past with, with the old old genetics we were finding it hard to get them to the right weights by that time and we were having to carry too many over well either sell them sell them at a, at a weight that was unappealing to the market or, or carry them through the summer and and finish them off the following year and that that created problems with bearing out country and and ground cover and so as we've improved the genetics, we've been able to turn them off earlier and earlier. And that's been a major factor in maintaining ground cover through those dry months. Yeah. And um, can you chat a bit about your pasture composition and, um, and you know, when you're making or when you're making decisions around pasture renovation? Um, like you monitoring the paddock's carrying capacity. Um, how do you use your soil tests sort of to make those decisions as well? Yeah, so back to Andrew Cumming, his, uh, his philosophy always was, and a lot of people in this room know the same thing is Phalaris and Clover just seems to be the, the only pasture that really will persist in the long run in this, this environment. Um, so that's what we're basing our, our entire production system on is, is Phalaris. Come on, I used to say, um, you want wall to wall Phalaris with clover growing out the middle of each Phalaris plant. And that's about the ideal pasture. But we've got a little bit more than that. You know, there's obviously ryegrasses around and there's, we've tried some fescues and coxfoots and things like that, but um, haven't really found them to persist. At Braidwood, our main pasture, pasture grass up there is, is fescue um, because it's, more active in the summer and it really um, it really self propagates quite strongly so um, you get every every part of the paddock will eventually fill in with fescue we also have coxfoots and phalaris up there to a lesser extent but um, being a and those grasses survive in that climate because you don't have we don't have that hot dry summer where most of the other grasses will go dormant um, they keep growing through that period but yeah in, in this part of the world phalaris and clover seem to be about it. So we, we've been using, well, it's actually a, a few years since I renovated a paddock, but um, whole fast Phalaris was the variety we are using then. Um, things have improved a little bit. There's a few more acid tolerant varieties around, etc. So yeah, that's pretty much it. So fertilize every year if we possibly can. Um, and liming was always just pre-sowing pre Phalaris. 
Um, we're probably at the point now where we're probably way past the point actually where we need to start reliming again. Um, but it's hard to, you know, there's just so much feedback about liming, top dressing passes with lime and how it takes an awful long time to get any re return from doing that. So. You've been to a few of our sessions about, um, you know, as part of uh, another project we're running with the with uh, MLA, MLA's discussion group on acid soils. Um, do you guys um, monitor, you know, your pH changes at depth of 10 to 20 centimetres? Yeah, we're, well, down at Luana, we're, um, we've, we're facing those issues because there's some quite acid soils down there and um, acid at depth. So we're just looking into how the, the best way might be to, to address that and aluminium as well. Um, but yeah, really interesting some of the some of the figures and things that are coming out of those acid soils studies um, about, I mean, the thing I've probably taken in most recently is that if you put it enough on the top, you can address any issues underneath. Whereas I was always of the opinion that you're probably, you know, you're never gonna change high aluminium levels in the subsoil um, it's just a matter of, you know, how much you put on top and how much time it's going to take to, to get down. Uh, but, yeah, very conscious of, of liming and putting enough lime on to, to try and ameliorate some of the bad conditions underneath. Yep. Yeah, I know. Yep, very good. And, um, and getting on to the seasonal variability, it's always an issue for farmers. Um, you know, how do you, what do you think of this issue? How are you sort of managing that both in the short term and, and you know, what do you think of the issues coming up uh, in the future? Yeah, look, I mean, seasonal variability is something farmers obviously face all the time. Um, you know, you compare this year to 2018 and you probably wouldn't get two more extreme years in lots of ways. And, and so I think within the current, cycle of years we already get we get we get so many extremes so i don't think um you, you know i don't think we're, we're rushing out to change our management strategies because of you know predictions of of, of a degree of warming in in the next 50 years or whatever it might be you know we, we, we're just trying to adapt with what we're what we've been what's been throwing thrown at us already but certainly the move the move to hear from Braidwood and, and having having the both properties working in conjunction with each other has been the, the biggest um, help in, in balancing climate variability for us. You know, they are very different climates. Braidwood's much more of a summer autumn autumn climate with tough winters, whereas here it's winter spring. Um, so we've found we've been able to to juggle stock around rather than having to to feed through those tough years, you know, just when Holbrook is shutting down and starting to get get tough at the end of spring, Braidwood's firing up and, and, and we can get some really good growth over, up there through the summer. So the last two years, we really avoided any extreme effects from the drought simply by shuffling cattle around between the, between the two places. So that was a huge, huge benefit. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, fantastic to be able to balance those, uh, you know, those different seasonal outcomes off each other between Braidwood and Holbrook, certainly. Um, so in the video, you also um, touched on, you know, succession planning and Fergus, um, you know, uh, how that's going to, you know, transition over. Have you got some... Um, wise words for all the farmers here that are going through similar things or will be? Oh, it's probably <laughs> something that's in our mind, I guess, but I've, this is my first full year home. Um, so it's, probably, it's something we haven't really got into yet, I guess. Um, Dad succession planning was, was it, you know, his only, pretty much just gone through so um but yeah i think it's definitely something we'll try to focus on i think um well very yeah shortly just yeah just to talk about it and start to plan um 
Yeah, because I, you know, in my situation, it it, it took a long time. Um, you know, my my family, father, grandfather, etc., um, were very very much of the old school of you know succession happens in the estate type of thing. Um, I didn't want that to be the case with us, so I, I guess I, I pushed fairly hard over the years to to try and try and get it happening while uh, while we're still all in our prime and and had plenty of enthusiasm and. It did take quite a bit of bit of work to get it. We, you know, we've got to we're, we've got to a really good point now, but it, it, it's only recently happened. As I, as Fergus said, it's only in the last last few years that, that it, it has actually all been finalised with my myself and my parents. So, um, so that's made me really conscious of um, probably how not to do it as much as how to do it. Um, so yeah, that's that's always in our mind and and. Yeah, we're very, very determined to, um, as complicated as it, as it will be, with four, four children, we're, we're really determined to, to do it early and try and try, to try and do it as well as we can. Um, there's two, obviously, two different areas to succession planning. One is manage, management succession, and the other one's, um, I guess, assets succession, for want of a better word. Um, management succession. Um, I've always been of the belief that the younger you can get that happening, the better, better for the next generation. Um, they're so full of enthusiasm and and um, you know really want to get their teeth stuck into things at an early age. So I can't see any reason why we wouldn't be looking at management succession um, well and truly within the next. Uh, five to 10 years maximum. Um, asset succession is another issue altogether on, on farms and that's gonna be a bit more complicated to work out. But um, yeah, we'll, we'll work something out hopefully. Um, the, the purchase of Luana was actually in a way um, done because of succession. Um, it's to try and, try and help us obviously build assets for off farm kids, but um, but also just to grow the business so that it can be, um, you know, ha we have the ability to fund whatever succession plans we make and whatever retirement plans we make. So, uh, and, and we, apart from the fact that we haven't been able to buy anything closer or joining us here, um, in a way that wasn't, the, Luana being separated physically was kind of a good thing in a way because that means that it'll be easier to to use that as a separate entity down the track for uh, whatever we plan to do. Yeah, definitely. That was a good buy, I reckon. <laughs> We've had that conversation before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kylie, have you got any uh, any more questions that you want to... Uh, well, there's a couple in the chat, actually, Phoebe. Oh, yes. There is, there is. Um, uh, there's a question from Nick. You mentioned annual fertiliser application. Do you put a set amount on a paddock each year or do you base your decisions off soil test results? Um, good question, <laughs> Nick. Probably more the former. We, we, we have been in the habit of just putting, putting as much as we can on all, all the country. Um, I certainly, I'm... I'm I'm more more leaning towards the um, the method of, of applying it um, through soil tests or through um, yeah paddocks we we graze harder I suppose we always seem to be the closer in ones um, so that they're starting to get more fertilizer really in a way regardless of um, of what the soil tests are saying. But um, now I'm really conscious of, of soil tests. We don't have a program going of, of mass soil tests of all paddocks all the time. We just do sporadic ones, um, but they continually show to be really quite similar over most of this farm. So we don't vary things too much. Um, but yes, yeah, still need to, we actually are even after you know 20, what is it, 24 years, we're still not up to the, level we probably need to be in, in some areas. So we're conscious about keeping that going. And uh, with, with Luana, we're, we're, because we're in a real development phase down there, we're, we're concentrating on that, on that to get uh, bigger inputs of fertilizer at the moment. Yeah, 
um, it, it, it's the one that's going to respond more than where we are here. Yeah. And, um, yeah. a, and a question from Bruce. Do you get any float on those good pastures, Jono? <laughs> <laughs> Do we get any float? Oh, this year wasn't so bad. Last year was a disaster. Uh, yeah, the, the coming out of the drought and um, yeah, 2018 winter was was horrendous for bloat. Uh, we battled the whole, well, it started in May and finished in October, I think. So it was the longest bloat season I think we've ever had. But yes, for us, we absolutely get bloat problems. Um, so yeah, just blocks and hay and sometimes liquids if they're liquid bloat stuff, if they're oils in the troughs, if they're on troughs. But yeah, real battle, real battle. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, you know, from now on we might, if we get a few more average seasons, we'll get a bit more grass balance in the pastures. Um, there's a lot of, all the phalaris is still there. I was worried that we'd lost a lot of our phalaris through those dry years, but it seems to be there. It's just not as vigorous as it used to be at the moment. So we're going to have to, well, the large cl the clover years, the last two years, will probably hopefully fire the phalaris up in the coming years as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and another question from Bruce, with paddock variation with P, all, uh, always a challenge if you have similar P across paddocks. So, yeah, um, how's yeah. your, yeah, your P across yeah. the property? Sorry, was that more of a comment or a question? So that's, yeah. Um, yeah just a comment. Right. Just a comment, when you were saying you were using the um, former method to Nick's question rather than the latter, I mean, it's always great to say we do it on soil tests, but if they're so uh, reasonably consistent across the paddocks, there's probably more variation within, so you don't know which part of the paddock to um, necessarily spread at different rates. Yeah. Yes, absolutely agree, Bruce. Yeah. I guess going back to Nick's question, we are sort of in the process, oh, we're just interested, I guess, in... Um, you know, finding out a bit more about the soil mapping, you know, companies these days and especially for, you know, Luana that's unimproved, but even Jergo now, like it's, we haven't done much, you know, we've improved the pastures. It was pretty run down when we first bought it. We've improved it and let them do their thing. But now we're at a stage where we might have to start, you know, putting more lime on. And so it's something we're probably interested in with the, the soil yeah. mapping variable, variable rate. rate. Um, you know, getting that data, but it's just the cost of doing it. But when you start, you know, adding up the cost of putting on that lime and, um, you, you know, you want the right amounts in the right places. So, um, yeah, we're not going to dive into it, but it's probably something that we're definitely looking at pretty closely. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, and um, have, sorry, have you, have, you, have you done any um, variable rate pH mapping? Yet, John, or no, you're no, just looking into it at the moment, yeah, right. Yep. I haven't done anything, just yeah, looking at maybe getting it, you know, getting a guy out to to start. Yeah, we haven't mapped the place at all. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. But it's interesting technology that's 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 coming in and um I think that'll be it'll have a big role in the future. That sort of variable rate. Climbing and I presume fertilizer will be the same down the track and uh, you know those spraying where you've where you've got the much more selective weed targeting all those things are um, yeah great technology I mean it's going to make things uh, much more economic I think. Um, a question for you Fergus from Sandy is there anything that you see uh, that you feel the business should change adapt to or consider as being a relatively new set of eyes coming back into the family business? Yeah, um, good question. Um, oh, look, I guess I I'm luck, lucky to work on a few pretty good operations and you always see and learn things and, yeah, you come, come back pretty um, yeah, hot-headed and wanting to, <laughs> yeah, dig your teeth in a little bit, but, um, you know, the, the business has changed so dramatically over the last 10 years. Um, so, yeah, dad's on top of it as much as I am, really. So, um, 
but yeah, that there will always be yes things you probably improve, but yeah, nothing. Just just the gene gene genetics probably is the first. You know, we've we've come a long way, but you know, still plenty more we can go, and um, we we just find that that links into everything really, like being able to turn off better animals that are healthier, you know, just the whole cycle um, stems off that for us. That's just how our system works a little bit. But um, yeah, in terms of changing anything dramatically so soon, probably just little things like, you know, as I was saying, the soil mapping and variable rates, just looking into it. Um, yeah, little things like that, probably a bit of technology and yeah, simple things maybe. What, what do you think you need to improve on the genetic side? Another one from Sandy. Oh, look, um, our, our herd is still based on the historic breeding that we, we had done. So, um, you know, you can continually improve the carcass qualities and eating qualities and even their structure. You know, we've seen a pretty big improvement in the last two, three years, I guess. So um, mm. we're on the right track, but um, there's still plenty to grow. Like each year we, we always have a tail end, um, which is getting smaller and smaller. But yeah, we'd hope one day that's quite an even line. And, um, yeah, don't mm. have to pull too many out or... No, and Fergus has you know, been absolutely fortunate to spend a couple of years with Brian and Lucinda and down there at Rennie Lee and um, just an absolute font of knowledge, obviously, and he's, he's learned a lot there and I think he'll, he'll, that'll allow him to bring a fair bit more knowledge of genetics back into, back into our herd. Um, so I'm expecting um, that that'll be a real benefit to us over time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, question from Kylie. Do you think that acidity could be an issue with pasture persistence, not being able to access deep moisture and less resilient? Yes, absolutely. Um, I've no, no doubt about that whatsoever. I think that that is a real issue. Subsoil acidity um, is an issue with uh, plant health and, and production. For sure, we've got a paddock, paddock right down the far end of this this place that um, we've been looking at lately, and um, it's just I've noticed over the last few years it's just not running the cattle that it that, that the other ones neighbouring paddocks are running, um, and I think it's exactly that issue. We haven't soil tested it yet recently, but um, all the phalaris is there, but it's just very small and and weak, um, and I think that could be. Uh, could be a subsoil acidity problem that it's just not getting its roots down far enough to to thrive. So that's that sort of thing is um, yeah that, that's what we're looking at with in terms of renovations. Um, we won't re-sow that paddock because there's enough perennials there. We just have to work out how to make them thrive. Yeah. Do you ever do any oversowing or uh, nitrogen fertilizer, Jono? Um, we haven't really, Kylie. No, no, we haven't really gone down that track. Used to do a little bit of cropping just to clean country up and pay, you know pay pay for the pastures a bit, but no, no oversowing as, as such at this stage. So I, I'm just looking at Bruce's comment here. So talking with Richard Simpson about um, replacing sub with Ceradella, and you know the the new <laughs> varieties and and things that's that's a big jump but has anyone got some comments on that like actually looking at alternative legumes yeah you can comment about that oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know no. <laughs> we don't, we don't know enough about it uh, yeah. to make any comment at all um yeah. Like, yeah there's these new obviously arrow leaf clovers and hard seeded clovers and which are meant to be you know Acid tolerant and bloat, you know. Yeah. Help, help you give you bloat, but uh, is there enough, you know, 
guess I haven't seen much data on it yet or know of many people really going down that path dramatically. And um, so, yeah, wouldn't <laughs> interested in it. But, yeah, we haven't, you know, dived into anything like that. We'll watch Bruce and see how he goes with it. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, right. So is there any other questions? People are allowed to speak. Yeah, Andrew, do you want to go? You have to unmute yourself. Um, I'll, I'll unmute you. <clears throat> Running the Braidwood and, and Holbrook, are, you, are they... You're running them both the same and just move the cattle numbers when you need to, or are they separate enterprise? The one's a fattening block, or what was it? More, yeah. How, you, how, you, how, how do you run the two? And I know you, you can't be there all the time either. How's that work? Yeah, the um, so Lawana's our attention is just that's going to be another breeding block, so purely cows and calves down there. I can't see that we'll be fattening fattening cattle there. So we'll have Braidwood and Luana as the breeding enterprises and then feeding the feeding the calves back into here at Jurgile to um, to grow out and fatten. That's that's the aim of, of of the structure of it at the moment. So we don't uh, yeah we tend not to ship cattle between the two very much. Um, we've got, we're, we're building a herd up down there. We'll keep we're not actually Carving heifers down there. We just um, we'll, we'll just keep feeding in cows, cows that uh, you know after pre testing, if we need to grow, keep growing that enterprise down there. Um, we'll feed them in either from Braidwood or from from here. Um, and so we, we're carving all our heifers at Braidwood, so we don't carve any heifers down here, and that's intentional. I hate carving heifers. <laughs> um, so and then everything comes all the steers come here and 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 whatever heifers we don't we don't breed with will come here as well. Uh, oh sorry. So so management of the of the two holder places, Hicksy did you say? No, uh, more Braidwood and, and, and here sort of oh, using, sorry. The using the different climates and how whether you you said you shuffle numbers around in different seasons and that sort of thing. I was wondering how that worked. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, no, management is um, so we've got two two full time fellows up there um, running it, and they're doing a great job. I used to go up, as probably as you know, I used to go up a lot of a lot of times in the early days to um, to help Dad out with whatever task he needed to do at that stage, and that wore a bit thin after a while. So once we took over, we employed we employed people up there. Um, they do everything that needs to be done. We go up every few weeks to to check on things, to make decisions, to catch up with what's been happening, um, and to work out new projects. But apart from that, no. I mean, we we set the overall program, but they run the day to day day to day program up there yeah and in shuffling the cows around is really that's a last last resort um yeah we don't want to do it but you know bring the young young stock down but yeah the last few years we've shuffled cows around a little bit but purely just because we've had feed down here and it's a lot cheaper than feeding animals basically um like it's, it is an expensive bill to cart mobs of cows around, but um, when you compare that with with having to feed them up there, it's um, pretty cheap, I guess. And we're lucky to be able to do that. Might not happen all the time, but the last 24 years, it sort of worked out pretty well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So I've really been focused on, um, ever since we bought Holbrook, I guess, not, my major focus has been trying to match as closely as possible animal animal demand with with feed production um, and that geographic separation of the two places allows that allows us to do that to a large extent um, with with the very varying seasons. Um, so we really we're really trying to avoid feeding 
cattle if we can possibly do it. And there's times obviously you can't avoid it, but um, but yeah, I just always felt fighting against the seasons not is not what we want to do. The way we want to structure our business. But having said that, with with land prices the way they're going, it's um, you know it's becoming harder and harder to to try and justify the return on assets that we need to be getting through just running a traditional grazing only system, which I think is why a lot of people are starting to go towards more intensive feeding systems um, just to try and increase return on assets. Um, not really the way I want to go, if I could possibly avoid it. I like the, um, you know, I like to, to have a bit of free time, not to be completely tied down to to the enterprise. So anyway, we'll see see what happens over time as to as to which way we go there. Um, so I think that answers your question, Nick, pretty well. And um, Sandy's just got a question. How did you establish a relationship with the Tassie farmers who buy your wieners? Yeah, so it's um, Greenham's is the, the people who buy the wieners, which most people around here know. Um, and we just three or four years ago we, we we sold them some some lighter wieners and they took them down to Tassie put them on grass and um they seem to be happy with them so they came back the following year and said have you got some more and um we've established a pretty good relationship with them now um they can't get into Tassie until well if they can't get in it's 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 unsuitable down there till about October normally because it's too wet um, but from that point on, they, they take a lot of cattle and, and then feed them into their, into their abattoirs at Smithton up in the northwest of Tassie. Um, so they leave here normally about 450 kilos, go down there and they try and put another, another couple of hundred kilos on them before they, um, before they process them. And um, no, we just, they're, they're just really a really good company to deal with. Um, and... Yeah, they they, uh, they they like where we're going with our cattle, which is really really pleasing. Um, we're getting some good feedback lately with that. Um, and as I said in the video, you know, really happy to be seeing them going on the grass rather than in the feedlots. I mean, feedlots are a really important part of our industry. I'm not arguing with that at all. A lot of our cattle have gone there, but um, yeah, it just I don't know, it just pleases me to to see them go to go to, go on the grass rather than in the feedlots if 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 possible. Yeah, that's right. How, how are we going for questions, everyone? Has anyone got any more questions for John O and Fergus? Well, there's one more there from Simon about yard, yard wean and has that improved the temperament? Absolutely, Simon. We've, um, we, we don't do a full yard, yard weaning. I call it a, par, a partial yard weaning. So we really just overnight them in the yards every night for a week and during the day tail them out a lane way down to a, a paddock. The first morning they go out, you know, they're a little bit restless. They push you down the lane a bit, but then they, um, because they've been locked up overnight, they put their head straight down and graze. And as soon as they start to get a little bit restless looking for mum, we bring them back in so that the, the first day of that, they might come back in at lunchtime. And then as each subsequent day goes on, they graze for longer and longer and forget about their mum for longer periods of time so the second day it might be two o'clock then four o'clock and then you know really by the fourth and fifth day of, of the week they're really not that interested in coming back in anymore so that's the way we do it um i didn't want to go the whole hog with feeding them in the yards so this seemed like a good compromise to to try and get the benefits of yard feeding without the full full commitment of, of feeding them um, and it really has dramatically improved the temperament of our cattle. Uh, you know, they, they, weren't, they weren't fantastic in the past. They were pretty flighty, um, but now they're absolutely quiet and, and so easy to handle and less stress on everything and everyone, machinery and bikes and people. So, um, and, and I think that's another reason why buyers are starting to like our cattle more and more because they are really, really nice to handle. Probably a bit of a personal view from both Dad and I, but um, we normally have the feed on hand during weaning, and um, we sort of believe to would rather them stay on the feed that they're used to, what they know, 
rather than put them on to hay that they've never seen or, or whatever it might be. Um, I just think that that helps to quiet them down and just settle them down. They're sort of they're sort of going to the environment they're used to. Um, that's just a personal view. I'm not saying putting them on the hay is bad, but um, yeah, just a view we have a little bit. Mm. Um, keeps it all simple. Keeps it simple, and yeah. Um, Yeah. So I think we're probably getting towards the, the end. Everyone will start yawning shortly. <laughs> That's my bedtime. But I just want to finish with the, the big question. Like, what do you think, you know, what are the risks in the next 20 years, do you see? What are the main risks to your farming business? Um, you know, I sat down this afternoon and tried to think of a few risks that I think are the most um obvious to me in the next 20 years and um, um, without wanting to comment on, on climate change or, you know, that's obviously one that I guess people are thinking we might say, but um, I don't see that. As I said earlier on, I see um, as much variability in, in the seasons year to year than um, I think we'll, we'll get with any, any, any sort of climate change. So I think we just adapt to that. That's that's just uh, something we factor in as farmers. So the main main risks I've jotted down, and these are in no particular order, but um, regu regulatory risk, you know, government regulation and red tape. I think is probably only going to get more and more as the years go by. City people are going to demand more accountability, and that's not a bad thing in lots of ways. But I just I just feel we we could get tied up with with red tape over time. There's a lot more compliance stuff we're doing all the time now, and it just seems to take up so much time. Um, Anti-farming activists, I think they're getting more and more powerful and more and more coordinated. And I think, um, yeah, they, they seem to be determined to shut, shut some farming enterprises down. Um, as meat producers, alternative meat products, um, it's becoming a, seems to be becoming a real uh, a real push for that from from some very wealthy and influential people um i don't i still don't feel it's going to put us out of business but it's just a it's just another competition factor that's you know i just don't know where it's going to go at this stage but i see that as a bit of a risk to our industry and the only other one i could think of at this stage was geopolitical tensions leading to Trade nationalisation. How's that? Um, so I'm thinking of things like you know China's ban on on Australian agricultural imports in certain areas and things like that, where countries are starting to to make trade decisions based on political beliefs or whatever it may be. That, I think that's always a risk in, in and Australia being such a export reliant country in agriculture. That's always going to be a risk for us. So they're, they're the risks I, I had down. Um, climate variability is certainly, you know, it's always a factor in, in our lives, but I don't see it as a, a greater risk than it always has been. What about you, Fergus? Have you, do you see anything else or? Um, yeah, no, <laughs> not, written, not particularly. Um, yeah, like obviously the, the climate, variability I suppose it just seems to be getting a bit more dramatic from one to another rather than um, dry and dry in my I guess we're in a lucky area here so you know go go further west and it's a different story I'm sure but um, yeah it just seems to be a little bit more variable at the moment but um, yeah as dad said I just it's a management thing and um, it's, it's hard to really prepare too much apart from the typical things until you're in that situation really if it's that bad um and then again it's just you've just got to treat it a bit like the bad droughts that have been in the past but obviously that if it become more frequent it's going to be harder to bounce back but um anyway it's just something we'll just face in the future if, if that's the way it goes or adapt yeah, yeah. right Phoebe, you want to wind her up? <laughs> uh, well, I think that's about it. Um...
Um, thank you very much, Jono and Fergus, for being available and all your time you've spent helping us get this uh, webinar underway. Really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for attending. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Kylie, do you want to say anything else? Oh, I don't think so. We've got a soil testing deal for you, Jono. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, we, uh, you know, Holbrook's about trying to set up some of these monitoring sites, um, you know, and to give a bit of a district picture of what's happening with soils. But yeah, it, it'd be great to um, to set up some sites and, and, and see how it's gone on your place too. Mm. Uh, uh, you set one up on Luana too. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Again, yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, and yeah, we'll. We will be bringing this story together. I think the next farm, I've just written some notes and said, you know, the next um, webinar would be great to look at a regenerative system and, and see how that, you know, how how that works. And I've just, the other one I thought is someone's a real data junkie because we've had a couple of people that, um, you know, are, you know, using their best knowledge to do things. I wonder if there's anyone out there who measures and monitors everything. And I wonder how, how, you know, that would compare. If there's anybody out there that fit those two, we'd love to hear from you. A few ideas spring to mind. What is, what is your <laughs> yeah, no, very good. So thank you, everybody. And yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for your interest, everyone. Thanks, Jono. Thanks, Fergus. Thanks, all. Thanks, Jono. Thanks, Fergus.